All right, this is the generic um, interviews for the Disney Global, and this is Nina Turner. First question, why do you think fans love Wanda and Vision and their relationship so much? I think fans love Wanda and Vision's relationship because it's a really pure expression of, um, of love and, um, and there's something that's really in the in the films has been really soft and gentle and um, born out of this AI character um, understanding how to feel. And so I think I think that's kind of a, a just a beautiful story to get to watch. And there's something really gentle between the two of them. And now we get to launch them into a completely wild and different world and watch them watch them be as normal as they can be in their wildest dreams. Thank you. Where do we find Wanda and Vision as the series kicks off? We find as the series kicks off, Wanda and Vision living in the suburbs as as two people in a relationship and they are just trying to pass as normal as possible and hope that no one discovers their secret of being superheroes. What do you think when you first heard, sorry, what did you think when you first heard about the concept for WandaVision? When I first heard about the concept for WandaVision, it was with Kevin Feige and Lou Desposito. And I immediately just thought it was going to be um, a very fun and challenging way to tell a story. I, it's, um, it's an amazing opportunity to kind of reinvent the wheel. And um, we get to challenge new audience members, hopefully who don't know Marvel as well, and then we get to challenge our, our fans to um, to watch a story unfold in a totally different way, but it is still 100% MCU through and through. Um, but yeah, I immediately, immediately fell in love with the, with the idea the moment I heard it. How did you prepare for the classic sitcom style? The preparation for the for all the sitcoms um, was was started with boot camp. It started with a Matt Shackman, our our fearless director leader, boot camp with Jack Schaefer, our um, our creator, and we as an ensemble as a cast we watched every single um, direct reference for each decade, and so we kind of a associated each episode with one sitcom and we would watch um, those episodes <laughs> together. And then on top of it, you, as an actor, you are trying, we're trying to tell these stories authentically through sitcom. So we're trying to, we're trying to recreate a real sitcom show that could have been filmed with the style and the tone and how we walk, how we dress, how we sound. And so, and your mannerisms. And so that would change decade to decade. So that is that's physical it's um it's costumes it's it's speech it's where your voice comes from so there's a lot of fun dorky actor preparation that you get to do and then the moment it comes into Malcolm in the middle everything becomes like super uh cynical and um and then that that transition was was also equally as enjoyable as um re referencing Bewitched can you describe the efforts behind the scenes from costumes to production design to dialect coach to ensure the classic style was authentic throughout each era? And in addition, do you have a favorite costume? The effort that went into every single department on this show was um, beyond anything I had seen. I, the thing that's so lovely about being a part of the Marvel universe is we 
we, the amount of time that is put into and detail that's put into our sets, that's put into our costumes. It's all, um, it's just, it's some of the, it's some of the best craftsmanship that I've seen on a set ever. And um, it always continues to blow my mind in many ways. And then to do, take all that craftsmanship and really make it specific to every single decade. It was, it was beautiful to watch, to, to pick out these vintage fabrics and even just building the underpinnings of the costumes to think about the wigs and the different cuts you had to have to have a certain type of curl level and the different, um, you don't even think about this, but the different types of false eyelashes that you'd wear, the, the shape of the nails, like there's so much detail that went into what you see um, and even like the love that went into our set design and our props. We have one plant that Catherine brings over in the first episode and that plant grows in every single episode and you maybe will, would completely miss it, but it's there. Um, so there's just all this like, and, and our props guy, like Russell, he, he puts all these Easter eggs all over the place for our fans. And so it's the whole thing's just been, um, kind of miraculous to, to watch it all come together. And um, I think it was one of the hardest jobs for every person on the show because of um, because of having to change so many decades. You don't just have like one decade um, that you can rely on, just even doing exterior scenes and how the picket fences have to change and the flowers have to change. So you just don't think about those things. Um, I would say my favorite costume was the 70s because I loved wearing a pregnant belly. Um, I just thought it was so funny to watch just like a dress spread and then have two legs sticking out from the bottom. So I think that was my favorite costume. Okay, that's great. Um, let's go, let's do this one again. How did yeah. the nine episode series format allow you and Paul to explore your characters? The nine episode format of our show um, allowed for so many in-depth um, realizations for both my character and Paul's character. And um, I truly believe that in every, from, from the first episode to the last episode, the whole fabric of, of this show is built on what we have already made. Um, and so to get to kind of burst that open and, um, get really specific with, with her life experiences and his throughout this show was, was really um, an incredible opportunity for both of us. And um, it allowed for us to, to complicate these characters even more than um, we've been able to. So it was, and to get to work with Paul was, is always the greatest joy, um, yeah. Describe the experience of shooting episode one in front of a live audience. The episode one being shot in front of a live audience was so terrifying, <laughs> but it was so fun. There is so much adrenaline. Um, it was a perfect way to thrust us um, into sitcom land. It really ripped the bandaid off. And it was complicated though, because it's not like theater. You're not playing to an audience, you're playing to the camera, but there is an audience that you kind of want to play to. So it, it confused um, my brain a bit, but um, it really launched us bravely into full throttle sitcom mode. And um, it's an experience I'll never have again, I don't think. So I was, it was just, a, I'll keep it close to me for a long time. You've touched on this a little bit, but can you talk about working with Paul for this series? Getting to work with Paul for this long has been so, so phenomenal. He and I, I think we, we both feel very lucky to um, have one another. We, 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 we work very similarly and um, we, we discovered that during Civil War, I, I asked him if he could run lines with me or he asked me for something we were shooting next week. And we had both already memorized our scene. 
and that's not the norm. And so with this show, he and I were able to constantly um, communicate and plan and um, Matt Shackman and Jack Schaefer were so welcoming of um, our ideas of what was already there. And, um, and he and I just like, that was just how our brains worked every morning was just trying to plan for what was happening next week and how to do it or how to make it better or what we loved about it. And um, there, it's so much fun to get to work with someone who is as um, invested and excited or even brings that out in you because of their own investment. And so it, it's, um, it's a great, it's a great experience getting to work with Paul and also he's fun and funny and kind. And it's really important for us when we're the lead actors on a set for um, people to treat each other kindly. And um, and I, and hopefully that may, makes people enjoy their jobs and their lives more. <laughs> and so I think we, we try to put that out in the crew every day as well. And um, I, think it, I think it ended up being a really special experience for all of us, even with all of the crazy challenges that were thrown at us during filming. Thank you, that was great. Explain how you came to WandaVision with both a directorial and an acting background in sitcoms. It seems kind of wonderfully inevitable that I ended up directing WandaVision because I grew up as an actor on sitcoms. I was on back lots and sound stages my entire childhood, but also as a director now as an adult, I do both comedy and drama and action and VFX stuff. So this project was a really wonderful melding of both my personal history as well as all the different things I love to do professionally. And as part of that question, how did you prepare your team and cast for the classic sitcom style? There was a lot of preparation getting ready for WandaVision. We had to be as authentic as possible to the sitcoms that we were creating. We wanted to make sure that we avoided parody and that we really felt like we were bringing to life these shows the way they would have brought them to life back in the day. So designer, cinematographer, actors, everybody did a deep dive into sitcom television history. We studied episodes, we read books about the making of, we talked to people who we could who had actually made them. Um, and for the, the actors in particular, we did a sitcom boot camp where we went through and watched multiple episodes and tried on different styles and tones. Why do you think fans love Wanda and Vision and their relationship so much? Wanda and Vision are an amazing love story. Uh, you know, they have relatively little screen time in the Avengers films compared to, you know, there's so many different characters and big events happening, but they make such an indelible impression, even in the short amount of time that we get to meet them. Um, they are funny and charming. Um, they clearly have this incredible connection and they're so different. Um, she is, she suffered so much loss. She's fiery. She's powerful. Um, he is this synthesoid who's a little bit human, but seems maybe more human than the rest of us, seems to know more about what it is to be human and his calm, knowledgeable presence with her fiery, passionate one, it really is the ultimate opposites attract. Where do we find Wanda and Vision as this series kicks off? The series begins with Wanda and Vision living an idyllic life in a sitcom America. Um, and where it goes from there is the mystery of the show. Can you describe the efforts behind the scenes from costumes to pro production design to dialect coach to ensure the classic style was authentic throughout each era? We were very careful in our attention to detail. We wanted to make sure the palette was accurate for each era and each show that the red in the 70s was the actual red we wanted. Um, we looked at uh, you know, dialect coaching and, and, and coaching about just sort of physical presence. Like how do you sit, how do you stand in different eras? Obviously wigs, hair was really important. Costuming using vintage fabrics. Our costume designer, Maya Rubio, did a brilliant job recreating these eras, but also making them feel very focused on Wanda and Vision as characters. And our production designer had to design basically the same house, both inside and out, in multiple different eras. So it's the same house, it's just changing with the style of the different eras. Describe the experience of shooting episode one in front of the live audience. Part of our goal of being as authentic as possible was a decision to shoot 
episode one in front of a live studio audience. Uh, some of our touchstones were the Dick Van Dyke show and I Love Lucy and those shows were done in front of a live audience and it really contributed to the style of the show that adrenaline of going out and doing it live in front of an audience and the audience was a, a character as well. Those laughs were real. They were, they were alive reacting to what they were seeing and how they reacted affected the performance. So it was really important to me that our first episode of WandaVision have that same spark, that same lightning in a bottle. We rehearsed it like a play, and then we went out and did it in front of an audience. The only difference between our audience and the Dick Van Dyke audience is they had all signed NDAs. Talk about the cast and what they bring to production. Let's start with Lizzie. Elizabeth Olsen is a marvel, no pun intended. She is capable of doing anything. Same with Paul Bettany. They are such amazing actors. They're their ability to do different tones and styles, to shift from drama to comedy effortlessly, sometimes in the same scene. Um, they have incredible chemistry together, which I think is part of the what makes that relationship work so much. Um, and they're fearless. They are fearless actors. They're willing to do anything and, uh, and do the silliest thing uh, to also the most adventurous stunts, things like that. They are, they're amazing. I was lucky to work with them. You touched on Paul, but you want to go a little further into Paul? Paul Bettany comes from theater, which I think is part of what made him so successful jumping around all of these different styles. They were very theatrical by nature, uh, the Dick Van Dyke show, uh, some of the other sitcoms that we were looking at. And even though he's known for incredibly nuanced, beautiful film performances, he has that theatrical ability to kind of fill a room and, and adjust his performance to whatever the, the, the room and the moment needs. And also I have to say he's a ham, the most amazing, wonderful ham, um, incredibly funny. I'm so excited for the world to see how funny Paul Bettany and Elizabeth Olsen are. And what about Katherine Hahn? Catherine Hahn is a miracle. She reminds me of Robin Williams in a way. She can do drama and comedy so brilliantly, often at the same time. Um, and yet she can also be, she can you know, move you to the heartbreaking uh, performances I've seen from her over the years. I mean, she is, she's, a, she's a one of a kind and having her in this ensemble with Paul and Elizabeth, um, Tiana Paris. Um, I really needed a whole bunch of actors like that who are capable of doing anything and shifting on a dime. And Tiana Paris. I worked with Tiana Paris years ago uh, on Mad Men. Um, she was uh, new to the show that year. I was new to the show that year. I loved working with her. She is amazingly talented. She comes from the theater like I do. We have a similar sort of approach and background. She is capable of doing any tone or style. Um, she's incredibly funny, um, a brilliant comedian, as well as like just a, a fabulous dramatic actor. So I'm excited for the world to, uh, to see what she does in this show. It's pretty amazing. Explain your somatic, cinematic approach to this series, why it is important, and how that was achieved. The show is a director's dream. Uh, you know, it requires uh, recreating these sitcom uh, classic uh, television shows, as well as full MCU action, and also it will delve into a world that sort of merges those two as well. Um, for me, it was an opportunity to use kind of every tool in my toolkit that I've collected directing comedy and drama and action over the years, and also to uh, to find some new tools because this show is such an original piece that uh, it, kind of, it required sort of constant innovation to, to keep up with it. And what is the benefit of this story being shared via Disney Plus versus on the big screen? The big screen stories are amazing, but in two hours, you know, you have a limit to how deep you can go into telling a story. But with WandaVision, we're able over nine episodes to go really deep into Wanda and Vision's relationship and to, uh, to hopefully move them forward into a place where, you know, one or both can venture off into other MCU properties. This is uh, Nina Turner with Disney. I'm doing the global generic. First question, describe the moment you knew you were going to be part of the MCU. Mm. I found out I was gonna be part of the MCU uh, after a meeting I had, top secret meeting, which was also a whole new world for me, um, with 
Uh, the director, Matt Chapman, the amazing writer, um, Jack Schaefer, and our producer, Mary Lovanos, um, in an office at Marvel where I was escorted in and escorted out, but everything felt very top secret and they laid out the idea for this show to me. And I was in my wildest dreams, could not imagine um, a, a character or entrance in this world that would be more fun, more trippy, um, more surreal or more delicious than, than, than this one. <laughs> I mean, it's just, can't believe it. Still can't believe it. <laughs> can't believe I get to see I'm, I'm in the MCU and that my, uh, first appearance is walking through a door in a 1950s black and white sitcom just makes zero sense to me. <laughs> Why do you think fans love Wanda and Vision and their relationship so much? I think these. I think fans love Wanda and Vision, um, and and their sweet, sweet relationship in the same way that I I do. I I can't speak for all fans, but I know that when I saw those movies with my kids, who are now older, but when I saw those movies for the first time, I remember through all of that, like you know, beautiful mayhem and this like huge, all those huge set pieces. Like there, I remember being so struck by this little teeny heartbeat in the middle of them which was the chemistry between Lizzie and Paul and those two characters and there's something so true and so real and so small and so beautiful between the two of them those characters and I think that's why fans really it really resonated with people because in the middle of all of this grandiose amazing superhero stuff that we have come to know and love there was this teeny little love story and i think that's why people are so excited about this this series is because it lets us drop into that and spend some more time with them that those big beautiful movies have not afforded us to yet great where do you, we find Wanda and Vision as this series kicks off and who do you play? We find Wanda and Vision as a newly married couple who have just moved to the town of Westview, which is a very nice suburb. It's a suburban town of, uh, um, it's a very nice suburban town and I play Agnes, their next door neighbor. And she happens to be in uh, a very familiar way. Uh, the, the neighbor that just kind of pops by unannounced, has a, offers a lot of advice, solicited and non, um, has a lot of, loves gossip and loves to kind of um, show her the ropes of this new town um, and also kind of make fun of it. <laughs> Is there anyone you channeled in portraying Agnes? I mean, there's so many. I, I mean, there's so, so many. Uh, I, you know, I, I, sitcoms are so embedded in like my personhood as like a comfort place, I think from when I was a kid. And so like, I, you know, I see so many like, you know, there's Ethel, there's Evan Nora, there's the guy from Seinfeld, can't remember his name. There's like Lenny and Squiggy or, you, you know, there's all, there's so many of, of these in every single sitcom that we know and love. There's, you know, th that neighbor character that's always there with just like friendly advice, wanted or not wanted, that always happens to plop themselves on the couch. Um, and almost seems to like just live off, just be living in the house, you know, nothing about their own personal life, but they're just there. And I feel like um, I was so fun to pay homage to all those amazing actors and characters. What did you think when you first heard about the concept for WandaVision? I mean, I had them repeated to me a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> because it was very trippy. And then I was so juiced up and just inspired that Kevin Feige and all of them were gonna take this kind of a 
uh, um, artistic and creative just swing because it is really truly unlike anything the MCU has ever done. And it is, um, it's so multi-layered and it is, I was just like mouth to the floor. Like, how are you gonna pull this off? And I was, I am so pleased to say that um, it has so far what I've seen has exceeded anything that I, I, I'm just so excited for the planet to see it. How did you prepare for the classic sitcom style? We had, I prepared for this, for this sitcom style by A, just watching a lot of them. Um, as a child myself, so I was, I was already born <laughs> ready. Um, and also we did a sitcom boot camp, all of us um, together, the cast, um, our director, Matt Shackman and the writer, Jack Schaefer, when we first got together to do this way, way, way back when, we all had like three weeks to rehearse and watch basically um, sitcoms for every era that we would be dropping into for every genre. And so for the 50s, it was Dick Van Dyke. We watched a ton of Dick Van Dyke. For the 60s, it was Bewitched and then onward and onward. But um, that's, that's how we prepared. We also, we had an amazing dialect coach by the name of Courtney Young who um, just gifted us with so much auditory material, interviews, commercials, just source material from the 50s and then from the 60s on so that we could just like, I, I would just be walking around listening to voices and um, she was an enormous help of getting, of getting that exact voice because it just it actually lives in a different place in your throat. Um, and uh, so that was it. That was an enormous help. And then those costumes. I mean, Maya, the designer, is just a goddess. And um, once you put that corset on, and you have to speak higher, and wear those heels all the time, and nylons, like it's a whole other ball game. And it just makes me very grateful to be able to wear tennis shoes and sweatpants underneath this Zoom that you're watching right now. <laughs> A lot of work. Can you describe the efforts behind the scenes from costumes to production design to dialect coach to ensure the classic style with, with un, authentic throughout each era? Yes, I mean, from every level of, in terms of production for this, the artists working um, behind the scenes to realize these, these eras were just mind blowing. Um, I mean, the production design is was extraordinary from every every little detail in there. Um, the costumes, as you could tell, Maya was is just a wizard, and she just made such unbelievable from the from the undergarments on, like you were in the period. Um, she even dressed the background of the. Um, uh, the audience for our live audience. Um, I mean, the camera operators, I, I, I mean, she, she outdid herself, everybody, the hair, um, the makeup, my team was unbelievable. Um, the best wigs I've ever, like all of it, like these, these artists that we worked with were incredible. And as I was talking before, Courtney Young, who did our, who was our dialect coach, really worked at not only just like going through different sounds, but um, just flooding our inboxes in the best way as an actor. It's like my favorite thing with source material from the actual era. So we got like, you know, it was like commercials and interviews and um, sound bites and things that we would just, I would just be able to like listen to and kind of get, find the vibe that way. Um, all, all of it. So, so from every department, we were just, for every er era that we moved into, we were just like cocooned in that, in, in that, in that world and in that space. Um, and really in that era, like I was just blown away by the artists that worked on this. Props, like, I mean, ev everybody, everybody was working at the top of their game. Now you talked about the costume. So what, did you have a favorite costume? 
Yes, I mean, I really, I, I, I love that 50s costume so much. I mean, and it's so crazy because you can't see it. The black and white wardrobes are so beautiful. And if you were to see those in color, you can't believe how vivid and incredible they are. But because she knows exactly what colors, uh, which is like beyond me, my, uh, but because she knows what colors would pop the most in black and white and on that kind of, in that kind of camera, she was able to pick the perfect ones to like, and just if you would have, uh, you know, it's, it was, it's amazing to think of us walking around in, in, those, in those costumes that would never even be seen in, in these incredible colors. I, I mean, it was pretty amazing. Describe, you talked about this a little bit, but describe the experience of shooting episode one in front of the live audience. Yes, yeah, so we shot the 50s episode in front of a live audience um, the live audience, which was of course very daunting, <laughs> but the, the positive of it and, uh, you know, as an actor, it's like my dream was that we were able to rehearse it together as a company really for like three weeks beforehand. And we were able to go through kind of like a sitcom boot camp almost. So we rehearsed it, I mean, to the, to the T because, you know, all, all of those things are all, you know, obviously so much about just timing. It's like doors and yada, 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 yada. It's like, and all the things that you see Wanda doing in the kitchen, like those were, it's like period um, effects. So it's like wires and, and, um, and uh, you know, it's not like CGI or anything. It's all like wires and things like that. So it took a long time to rehearse. And the laughs that you hear are the laughs from the studio audience fr from the day that we shot it, which is also pretty incredible. Also props to everybody that was sitting in there and kept that a secret for so long. I know you had to sign a gazillion things, but I, it's just pretty amazing that that, um, that happened and they, um, that, that we were able to pull that off is pretty extraordinary. We were very, the script is written by Jack Schaefer uh, the scripts were written so to the era that they are, that they're in. So the jokes, especially in the 50s, are so charmingly baked into the 1950s that I think that a lot of us were like wondering if a modern audience watching it live was going to find it funny. <laughs> and we were so surprised once we got there as to how many like laughs were coming like it was just such a charming delightful um beautiful nostalgic day and we were racing around behind the scenes with quick changes and props and I, I mean it was mayhem in the in the best kind of a way and it, it was like I again couldn't can't believe that that was my introduction to the MCU. <laughs> Can you talk about working with Lizzie and Paul for the series? I um as I I love I have been a huge fan of Lizzie Olsen's for a bazillion years and um I was so excited to get to work with her and to know her. Um I think she's such an extraordinary actor and has such integrity and depth as a human being and as a performer. And, and Paul as well, like the both of their, and their chemistry together in the MCU is, is so tender and so true. And, and especially in the, in the, in the middle of all of those beautiful set pieces and all of those superheroes to have like that real true thing, which is their, that love story. I was so excited to be able to work with the both of them as performers um, because I just think they're extraordinary. They're both so, and they all, they check all the boxes that I as a performer are my, is like the way to my heart. Like they're incredibly hard workers. They're diligent, they're craftspeople. They're not precious. They, um, they're, they look after themselves. Like they're, they just want to work. They're like, they, they're decent, good people. They like, they're, I, I'm just, Lizzie, um, I got mm -hmm. to spend a lot of time with and she's just a tremendous 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 human being i i care about her deeply and i just think she's also an extraordinary performer 
No problem. So this is Nina Turner and I'm doing the global generic. Mm -hmm. Why do you think fans love Wanda and Vision and their relationships so much? That's a really good question. I think the reason fans love Wonder and Vision and their relationships so much is we, I think we all see couples that meet at, that complete each other, but they complete each other at really bad places within themselves. And I think that Wonder and Vision just complete each other in, in, in a really great way. And it's what makes them such a strong unit and powerful fighting unit. Where do we find Wanda and Vision as this series kicks off? When, so when the um, series starts, um, we're gonna find Wanda and Vision a little confused. Um, they appear to have found themselves in a sort of idyllic American suburban 1950s black and white life. And they realize they're in some sort of sitcom. And then as, the episodes progress, they begin to realize that they're hurtling through the American century, decade by decade, uh, week by week. And, you know, Vision begins to suspect there's something not quite right about this town. What do you think when you first, what did you think when you first heard about the concept for WandaVision? Um, I thought it was a, when I first heard of the concept of this show, I thought it was bananas and brilliant. And um, Kevin and I have been talking um, about um, uh, The Visions, which is a really great um, uh, comic book series uh, that I love about The Vision in, in suburbia. And then uh, also talking about the, uh, House of M, and it just felt like a really great mashup with um, some American sitcom stuff thrown in too. Speaking of the sitcom, how did you prepare for the classic sitcom style? Well, there are many, and I think that you can really, it's really interesting if you start studying it like we had to, you see how different they are from where we begin in the 50s to where we end in the sort of aughts with we, we so we start with um the dick van dyke show and then bewitched and then we end up with sort of malcolm in the middle and modern family and you go from this incredibly warm uh 1950s american exceptional optimism to this very cynical quite cool in tone um uh, show uh, shows like Malcolm in the Middle and uh, and um, Modern Family in the nineties and the two thousands. Great, this one is is going to be a little tricky, but you'll have to, you'll have to figure out how to get the uh, kind of the question in there. Um, can you describe the efforts behind the scenes, from costumes to production design to dialect coach, to ensure the classic style was authentic? throughout each year? Um, I think one of the things I love about this show is how every, I think everybody was given free reign to be incredibly creative. And, you know, we have some uh, extraordinarily um, uh, fastidious uh, heads of department like, uh, you know, Jess Hall, who I've known for years and made a, a couple of films with, is the DP and the amount of energy and effort and, uh, and hours that were put into making sure that we had a, a, a incredibly accurate style of photography for each and every one of these um, eras. And that, um, that was across the board, but the, the, the costumes were incredibly accurate, our hair and makeup, the wigs, and, um, and you know, all the way through to dialect coaching for Lizzie specifically, you know, to, to get that sort of strange mid-Atlantic thing that people did in, in American TV at the time. Uh, and, um, uh, and indeed the decision by our brilliant um, director, Matt Shackman, 
who decided that the first episode had to be shot in front of a live studio audience. I was very resistant to that, but he pushed and he was right because it gave us that performative style that I think you can feel in those shows of the 1950s. And out of that, did you have a favorite costume? Um, if I am honest, my favorite costume was my ridiculous 1990s Halloween costume, um, which is an homage to the original uh, Vision costume from the comics. And it made me look so ridiculous that um, it was very easy. I didn't have to work too hard for uh, laughs. <laughs> How did the nine episode series format allow you and Lizzie to explore your characters? So when you're making these big movies, Avengers and, and so forth, Civil War and all of that, there are so many characters that necessarily um, your time on screen is curtailed um, and you're having to pack an awful lot into a very short amount of screen time. Um, uh, whereas there's something really expansive about this many hours of television that allowed uh, Lizzie and I to really drill down into each of our characters and also um, their relationship. And, and that was, that was um, it was a really, really fun time. Okay, and you did touch on this a tiny bit, but describe the experience of shooting episode one in front of the live audience. Okay. Um, so when it came to shooting episode one, um, I remember the day that Matt Shackman told Lizzie and I that we were gonna shoot it in front of a live studio audience. And I was really recalcitrant. I, I, I did not, I dug my heels in. I was not keen on the idea. It had been 20 years since I'd been in front of an audience. And, um, but he was insistent. And it turns out that he was entirely right. There is a performative style in, the Dick Van Dyke show that you can feel that there is an audience in the room because there's an audience in the room and, and they are projecting past the camera to that audience and playing for their laughs, which are in turn taped and, 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 and the thing that we hear on the, in the television show. And I think it, it was, it, it really bonded everybody together. The, the crew were wearing um, costumes. Uh, we were, of course, were wearing costumes and we were also running behind backstage to, to um, you know, bumping into each Catherine Hahn and falling over at the prop table and then coming on stage. And, and, and I think it, it, it gave us that sense of style. It gave us a sense of fearlessness because uh, we were all there and thinking, and Tiana was in the audience because she's not in the first episode and she was, we were all, we were all like, well, I guess this is what the show is. And so you really, you were able to really let go and just go for it after that. It was a, it was a great experience. Great. Um, can you talk about working with Lizzie for the series? Yes. Um, so Lizzie and I have been making these movies for quite a bit now, and we got to know each other really slowly. And I guess slowly over time, I suddenly realized, I slowly realized it dawned on me that she'd never been late on set once. And I love that. Uh, <laughs> And it turns out that we have exactly the same work ethic and she's um, fastidious. She, uh, uh, she always comes to set with an idea and believe me, that's rarer than you would think. And, and so do I. And so we're both professional and really want to work at it and really want to, it to be the focus, you know, of, of what we're doing. That's why we're there and we work really hard at it and she works really hard at it. And, um, and uh, I think we, by, by this point, I come to trust each other so much that um, uh, it, was just, it was just very easy to take big risks. Excellent. That is the end of the generic. The Disney global generic. You can start whenever you'd like. Thanks. Describe the moment you knew you were going to be part of the MCU. 
the moment I found out I was going to be a part of the NCU, I was filled with so much joy and excitement. I literally thought I was an actual superhero and tried to jump down some stairs. But thankfully, my family calmed me down and said, okay, let's just breathe and be excited in that way. Great. Why do you think fans love Wanda and Vision and their relationship so much? I love Wanda and Vision's relationship so much. It's just so beautifully crafted and Wanda Vision the show actually gives Paul and Lizzie the actors the space to dive deep into these characters and give us more than what we've been able to see in the theatrical films and I think the fans respond to just the tenderness between the the two I mean you're in the Marvel movies you have things blowing up and fighting and shooting which we love but also this tenderness and this care and gentleness that Wanda and Vision have for one another is really beautiful to see. Who do you portray and what do fans of the MCU know about her so far? I play Monica Rambo, who we were introduced to in Captain Marvel, where she was a young girl. Her mother is Maria Rambo. And then you have Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel, who was like an aunt figure to her. So that's where we first met Monica. And then in WandaVision, we pick up with Monica Rambo as an adult. And throughout the series, we begin to learn what's been happening in her life over the course of those years we missed and how she's evolved or not <laughs> and what she, um, how she will be incorporated into Wanda and Vision's world. What do you think when you first heard, what did you think when you first heard about the concept for WandaVision? When I first heard the concept for WandaVision, I thought, wow, this is a huge undertaking. And I'm also very curious how that works, um, paying homage to classic American television sitcoms and big epic Marvel movie, action movie. How do those the two things come together. So I was my my interest was definitely peaked, and then to read the scripts and actually talk to the creatives about it, my mind was blown, and I'm really excited for fans to get to go on this journey with us. Speaking of fans, what do you think fans will think about the series? I think that the fans are going to love WandaVision. It's fun, it's wacky, it's wild. It deals with some really heavy elements like grief and loss. And then you have the tenderness of love. And then you have the big epic action Marvel movie side of it. So there's a lot to cling on to and just hold on for this ride, guys. <laughs> Describe your experience working with director Matt Sheckman, Marvel Studios, and Lizzie and Paul. My experience working with Matt, he is has got to be the most patient person in the world. His level of calm and chill and we got this is beyond anything I've ever seen. It was really dope to work with him. I actually had worked with him previously on my first episode of tell or on my first tv series um as a recurring character um on mad men so to bring this full circle and get to work with him again and he's from the sitcom world he was a child actor and so his knowledge and insight about the um structure and the tone of this world was a huge huge um benefit to all of us and it was just a really good time and working with Paul and Lizzie, working with Paul and Lizzie on WandaVision has been a huge treat. They are such generous human beings and fun and funny and just watching them get to dive deep into these characters and be given the space and opportunity to really explore um, more of their relationship has really been a treat. And tell us where you will see Monica Rambo in November 2022. So not only do you get to see Monica in WandaVision, it was just announced that Monica Rambo will also be in Captain Marvel 2. 
Um, she'll be joining um, Miss Marvel and Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel in Captain Marvel 2. So I'm really excited about that. Now that we've seen episode four, what is WandaVision about? Well, WandaVision is about a sitcom, a very unexpected Marvel Universe sitcom. And episode four is the episode where things start to kind of un not unravel, but kind of reveal themselves. So that's kind of where Darcy Lewis comes in to, uh, to start to crack the mystery open. Why do you think fans love Wanda and Vision and their relationship so much? Well, as a fan of Wanda and Vision, you know, from the Avengers movies and uh, their romance, I think is one of the more emotional parts of the MCU. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful relationship and kind of tragic, of course, if you've seen Avengers Endgame, which is what immediately comes before this. So... I think anyone with any curiosity whatsoever about Wanda and Vision, uh, this is the show for them. Okay. How do you feel about returning to the MCU as part of this first ever Disney Plus series? I feel so excited and honored to be a part of the show and a part of the first Disney Plus Marvel merge show. Uh, you know, when I heard that they were coming out with all of this content, I was just really excited to see them. Uh, so to be involved is just an absolute dream come true. And I, I'm so grateful for um, what they've done with Darcy, with Dr. Darcy Lewis, I should say. Okay, speaking of that, introduce your character when we last saw her and what she has achieved since then. Well, Darcy Lewis was first introduced in the first Thor movie. Uh, she is Jane Foster's intern, and the joke kind of is that she's a political science major. And Jane Foster, of course, is a scientist. So there's a little bit of a mix up, and she was the only applicant. So we've seen Darcy go from somebody who's kind of just there uh to kind of look around and be excited about things so now obviously jane foster and dr eric selvig and the events of thor and thor the dark world has impacted her life so much that she's been in school clearly for years and become an astrophysicist herself so she is now dr darcy lewis and uh that's really cool what mystery is darcy trying to help solve Darcy has been brought in to essentially help solve the mystery of what is going on. Because initially, you know, the FBI and, and everybody are, they're investigating this, this town and this bizarre thing that's going on. So she is the only one out of everyone that they've brought in who is able to kind of crack the mystery and, and interpret the signals she's getting to realize that they're broadcast signals. Who does Darcy work alongside in WandaVision and what's their relationship like? So in WandaVision, Darcy kind of works for herself, but she is partnered up with Jimmy Woo, who viewers may know from Ant-Man and the Wasp, who is played by the wonderful Randall Park. And uh, they kind of become an unexpected duo. And uh, yeah, it's really, it's fun to play. And I think, um, it's a pairing that that fans of the, the movies might be excited to see. <laughs> Working with Randall Park is a, a wonderful experience. He's obviously a lovely person and an amazing actor. And uh, I loved him in Ant-Man and the Wasp. So I was really, really excited for these, uh, these two characters to merge. Again, it's Nina Turner with the global Disney generic. All right, number one question. Now that we've seen episode four, what is WandaVision about? Hmm. WandaVision is about this uh, um, strange occurrence happening in this town called Westview. 
uh, in New Jersey. Um, from the from the perspective of Jimmy Wu, he arrives into this town uh, on a missing persons case because someone has gone missing, and he discovers that there is in fact this missing town. And um, uh, not only that, but the people uh, around the town and near the town don't remember that this town even exists. So it's this real puzzle that that he and uh, um, uh, Monica Rambo and and Darcy Lewis. Uh, attempt to, to, to solve. Um, uh, and, and within this, within this world is essentially uh, this idyllic sitcom life that, that kind of changes from various uh, eras uh, of sitcom. And, uh, uh, um, and in that world is Wanda and Vision and, and, and uh, uh, basically uh, Jimmy Wu and, and, and the team are, are, are trying to figure out what's going on. Why do you think fans love Wanda and Vision and their relationship so much? Uh, well, I think fans love Wanda and Vision uh, for many reasons. I think in part because um, Elizabeth Olsen and Paul Bettany are just incredible performers and, and very, very fun to watch. But I also think that there's, there's a real uh, a love story there that I think is, 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 is so... Um, so beautiful, and uh, and to see them together in love and and happy is just something that that is uh, it's just so fun and watchable, especially in in, in these sitcom formats for Wanda in Wandavision. Uh, to see that that they are you know that they're living this kind of ideal life, but then to also have that life kind of slowly break apart and 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 crack and 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 to see that there, there's something going on there that shouldn't be, uh, I think makes it really interesting. But ultimately it's, it's, it's these, these two uh, just amazing superheroes played by these amazing actors uh, that makes them so, so fun to see. How do you feel about returning to the MCU as part of this first ever Disney Plus series? I am so excited to be a part of uh, the first series, uh, Marvel Studio series on Disney Plus. I just think it's an honor uh, to to be kicking it off, um, uh, in particular to 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 be able to 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 perform in this show uh, because this show is so different. It's so unusual. It's so uh, uh, risk taking. And uh, but it's also just so so smart and clever and and uh, and there there's so much heart in it and and uh, I just think that it's it's just such a unique uh, experience that that to be a, to be a part of this show it, it's really a, truly a thrill for me. Speaking of that, introduce your character when we last saw him and what brings him to this new mission? So uh, we last saw Jimmy Woo uh, in uh, the movie Ant-Man and the Wasp, uh, uh, where he uh, was trying to essentially uh, make sure that uh, uh, Scott Lang stayed on house arrest and uh, uh, um, in San back in San Francisco. And, and now we jump uh, many years later where Jimmy Woo has been called to uh, figure out what was going on with this town, uh, which has essentially disappeared, uh, uh, all of its inhabitants and, and, uh, and the town itself. Uh, and, and everyone around the town has no recollection of this town ever existing. And, and he's been tasked to, uh, to, to, to figure out uh, exa what exactly is happening and, and to solve this puzzle. What is it about Jimmy Woo that makes him so appealing to fans? Uh, I think Jimmy Woo is appealing to fans because uh, he, he, he's a bit of an unusual character in that he is a, a, an FBI agent. And, you know, traditionally FBI agents in TV and, and film, ha, you know, have been these tough guys, these alpha males. Um, these badasses and uh, Jimmy is a, a little different in that he's he's very earnest and sincere and sweet and there there's a childlike nature to him uh, but he's also at the same time he's very good at his job and he's very focused on 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 figuring this out and uh, and uh, and there there's a badass 
thing about him too, but there, there's also this real desire to connect to people. And there's this love of uh, things like uh, close, you know, close up magic and card tricks and, and, and these little things about him that I think make him uh, a little strange, but, but so fun to watch. Who does Jimmy work alongside with in WandaVision and what's their relationship like? So in WandaVision, uh, at least uh, in the episodes that we've seen thus far, Jimmy works very closely with uh, Darcy Lewis um, uh, and he works closely with Monica Rambeau uh, in trying to figure out what's going on in, in this town. And um, uh, um, his, his camaraderie, particularly with uh, Darcy Lewis, is, is a very fun dynamic to, to, to watch because the two are very different. They're very different from each other. You know, Jimmy is, you know, he's not one to speak badly of people, whereas Darcy will just say what's on her mind. Jimmy is, you know, he's, uh, he, he, he's very, uh, you know, there's an innocence about him and whereas Darcy will just, you know, would just criticize you to your face. Um, uh, so to see them two working together uh, and, and in particular to see them two getting along so well and to, to, to see that this kind of oddball pairing works so well, uh, I think is, is, is pretty cool. Speaking of that, um, describe the experience of working with Kat. Uh, working with Kat has, uh, um, working with Kat was uh, amazing. Uh, I love Kat. I hadn't worked with her before. I knew of her, obviously. Um, uh, I was a fan of hers, but uh, getting to work with her on, on the show was, was really fun, really fun. And, uh, you know, she's just a, a, a real down to earth, funny, um, smart, talented person. And, uh, uh, and it shows on the screen. And, uh, and we just had a lot of fun. We just had a lot of fun working uh, uh, on the show together. Okay, Jack. Why do you think fans love Wanda and Vision and their relationship so much? I think that I think that fans are loving Wanda and Vision together because of the way that they delight in each other's company. Um, there's so much respect um, there and so much support. You know, they they want to do right by each other, um, and they're in it together. You know, in this in this new town, um, in this environment, um, and I think fans are finding that really winning, and they're and they're rooting for them. Nice. Explain the genesis of this crazy idea of WandaVision. So WandaVision was a concept that that I heard about around the Marvel offices. Um, it was Kevin Feige's idea to find a way to blend sitcoms uh, with Wanda and Vision. Um, and I thought, how in the world can I get on that show? Because that sounds totally insane. And how would you ever even begin to do that. Um, so they, you know, they had a lot of ideas and visuals and and kind of hopes and dreams for it. Um, and I was invited to pitch. Um, and and what I brought to it was like an overarching structure, um, a larger story um, for what was going on, um, as well as sort of, I mean, now that um, episode four has dropped, the notion of episode four of sort of stepping out of the the sitcom space and and following Monica and Jimmy and Darcy and, and what their investigation is like, um, that was part of my initial pitch. Um, and I would say sort of like the headline of my pitch was, how do we find a way to um, to kind of slam these two worlds together structurally, tonally, um, and and still have it be satisfying and still have characters um, that you that you care about um, and want to follow? Nice. Where do we find Wanda and Vision as the series kicks off? So at the top of, of WandaVision, um, we, we pick up with Wanda and Vision in this new town of Westview. Uh, they've just gotten married. Um, they're new to the community. They want to make friends and want to fit in and want to be quote unquote normal. Um, and that proves to be a challenge um, uh, for two enhanced people such as they are. What is the benefit of this story being shared via Disney Plus versus on the big screen? 
I think what's so special about this project being on Disney Plus is this is a show about television shows. <laughs> and it is something that plays with our love of television, our viewership, how we consume content. Um, and, uh, you know, so that sort of thematic is at play. So it, so it makes sense um, that it would it would be in this episodic form and, and it would be something that you can watch from your couch the way that we watched all of these sitcoms from our couches over the decades. Um, and then it also, the, the, the format of it, you know, the way that we play with aspect ratio and the way we play with, with you know, the cinematic look of it, um, it's, it's, a lot of it just it just feels right on on television in that sort of viewing mode. Um, and then when it, you know, the moments where it breaks open into more of a, a cinematic aesthetic, it's so like refreshing. You sort of feel like you're bursting out of a box. Um, I think it's perfect for for streaming for Disney Plus. It's just, yeah, it's great. This was your first time writing for Wanda and Vision. In researching these characters, what stuck out to you about their personalities and behavior? Um, so in, in researching in the comics and also even more so in the MCU, um, learning about Wanda and Vision, um, you know, I think that, I think what stuck out for me, you know, for Wanda was, was very much her, her sadness. Um, and also not just from, you know, the pain of her past, but I think her sadness at being misunderstood. I think there are moments that we see her in the MCU where it, it appears that it's, that she feels like it's almost futile um, to, to try and connect or to try and, and help anyone understand who she really is. Um, and I think that that that's what vision does provide for her is he he is interested in knowing the complete woman and knowing what's what's you know inside her heart and her mind and and he sees past the powers i think because he is such an unusual you know creature himself he's a synthesoid and he's sort of questing on his own um you know exploration of of what he is and who he is and how how his self intersects with humanity. Um, so I think that she, you know, is is always kind of trying to find her place in humanity and, and so is he. Um, and they find a comfort in each other. And that's very much what we wanted to carry forward into the series. The series spans the decades from classic sitcoms of the 1950s to those of the early 2000s. Can you explain how the scripts evolved, how the style of dialogue changed with each episode? Um, so we knew that we would be moving through um, the various time periods and the various eras of television. Um, and we, we, when we mapped out what episode, you know, belong to which era of television, um, the writers of each of those episodes, um, it sort of did a deep dive. Um, I mean, we all watched, you know, a million shows together, but they, I tasked them with being experts um, in the tropes and style and like everything from visual to wardrobe to really mostly, you know, turns of phrase. Um, and and so they wrote with that expertise. And then we just, you know, tried to like dial that up um, with every episode as best we could without, without becoming kind of um, heavy handed with it. We, you know, we always wanted the, the texture of it to feel um, accurate and not, and not like parody. Um, on the actual page, um, you know, we, we researched, we, we pulled scripts from, from these, all these different shows um, from the WGA and we would mimic whatever the format was um, of the time. So our, you know, the, the, um, the pilot episode has the same screenwriting format as an episode of Dick Van Dyke or Leave It to Beaver or the Donna Reed show. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't necessary, but it really seemed to help everybody get on the same page because all of these, you know, um, from when, you know, our, our director came on board to the department heads, everybody knows what a contemporary screenplay looks like. I mean, it's, it's quite jarring to kind of know you're doing a Marvel project, but you look down and it looks like it was like an, it's like an old timey sitcom. I mean, the only thing that we didn't do is we didn't type it up on a typewriter, which would have been cool, but there was no time for that. That would have been cool. 
Um, do you have a favorite era that you found the most fun to work on? Um, I loved working um, in the 50s, I think because that was sort of the origin of the idea was, was one envision in black and white, um, multi-cam 50s sitcom. So, so it was really being in that space felt very right. Um, and it also, it was really, it was fun to sort of dig into like the expressions of that era and especially writing for Paul and his um, sort of taking the, what we know from the American sitcoms and like adding that special spice of, you know, Britishisms, which he was, he was very helpful. You know, we, we gathered a few and put them in the script and then, um, but he was the one who was like this, you know, this, this works or this is what I would say, or I would actually say it like this. And it just, I mean, it's like charming upon charming upon charming. And this is the last question. Talk about the cast and what they bring to the production. So Elizabeth, Paul, Catherine, Tiana. So both Paul and Lizzie are, are masters of preparation um, and they are united in that. I think one of the reasons that they work so well together is they're both so interested in, in being prepared and knowing what they're doing. Um, they're, you know, they're like kind of good students in that way. Um, and so, so that, and that also translates to their investment in the actual show. Both of them, I pitched the scope of the show to them very early and they were both so on board. Um, and that's, I mean, that's what you want more than anything from your actors is for them to be excited about what the work is. And they were so excited and so committed to making it great. Um, and then, you know, they really did their work um, to, to embody the different eras, to become so familiar um, with each of these sort of modes of performance that are very, very different than what they normally do in the MCU. Everything from their posture and how they carry themselves to like the level of their voice and the quality of their voice. Um, and, and then of course the comedy piece of it, like is just a whole different thing. Um, from what um, they've done before in the MCU. And they just, they were just so, so, so game. Um, Catherine Han is, can do anything. She just can do anything. And it was like getting one of those like multi-purpose tools when you're like stranded on a deserted island. Like it, it was the most incredible gift. And we were like, you know, we were all already very excited about, um, you know, the role, but then to have her take it on, we just like dialed everything up. We were like, it's gotta be good enough for Catherine Hahn, <laughs> which was just a really wonderful um, place from which to write. Um, Tiana, um, I, I, her casting was so important because Monica is one of those characters that needs to say a lot without saying anything. Um, she needs to communicate, you know, the, the depth of her feeling um, without, um, you know, sort of breaking this, the facade of being, um, you know, re really good at her job and being a professional. Um, and so a lot of, a lot of her performance is not on the page. And we were so lucky to have somebody um, with her talent come and, and bring so much to the unspoken moments. Um, I mean, Kat Dennings is, is actually, Paul says this, Kat Dennings is funny in her bones. <laughs> It's much, it sounds much more charming when Paul says it in his accent, but he's like totally right. Like she's just funny and um, I could write for her all day long. Um, and so could the writer's room, like all of the Darcy jokes are just a pleasure to work on and, and live inside. Um, and she's just wonderful to work with. Um, Randall Park um, really, really made Jimmy Woo. I mean, I, I wasn't a part of that project, but he, he brought like this like dorky efficiency thing that like, I don't know, I wouldn't even know how to describe it, but it, it was, it's just so much fun to watch. And it was, and, it, and he, he is also, he is also a very prepared performer and a, like a very, he's a very, very kind person. And I think that's probably my favorite piece of Jimmy is that he, he's kind to his colleagues and respectful to his colleagues because as a, as a good worker and a responsible person, um, he respects that in others. Um, and, you know, I, I, I love seeing him in the show because I mean, 
it's like, these are the kind of colleagues that I want in my life. Okay. Why do you think fans love Wanda and Vision and their relationship so much? I think people love Wanda and Vision so much together because they just, well, they just have really great chemistry. And I think you can, I think you can really tell how much Paul and Lizzie really, really like one another, uh, how much fun they have working together. Um, they're just, they're just two people you root for. So, you know, you can root for them together. It's, it's even better. What do you think, what did you think when you first heard about the concept for WandaVision? Um, I think my first reaction to hearing about the concept for WandaVision was, what? Like, it's like, what? It was that, like, can you, wait, can you explain that to me again? <laughs> it's a lot of that. Um, and then seeing it all unfold and getting to unpack everything. Um, that was just so much fun and, and wondering how it was all gonna come to life. It just, I, and, and it has come to life in the most beautiful way. It's just the attention to detail, the acting, the music, the, just everything about it. It's just a remarkable piece of artistry. Great. Who do you portray and what is she like? I play a woman named Dottie. She is the town queen bee ruler. Um, she, I wouldn't say is the nicest person. Um, she, I think she can be very mean. Uh, she also, I think has a, a real appreciation for getting things right. <laughs> She's, I think, you know, there's something admirable, I think, about someone who can appreciate perfection. <laughs> no, she's a perfectionist. Um, I can, I can appreciate that. I, 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 I'm a bit of a perfectionist, I think. Well, that kind of goes along with this question. How did you capture Dottie's intense personality? <laughs> How did I capture Dottie's intense personality? Gosh, I, um, well, I first, I guess it's, it's good to know that I did, you know, it's always nice having someone confirm that what you try to do actually translated. Um, you know, she and I are not similar people. I'm definitely not a queen bee. I have never ruled a roost like that. I, I don't, I don't have people like trying to impress me and, and, you know, wanting to get in good with me. Like, I've never been like the super popular kid who's been kind of an outsider. So um, I don't, like that's totally foreign. Um, um, I mean, I'm not nice, obviously. So that part was really easy. Um, you now I, uh, you know, you try to find something you can relate to in any character. And I think just trying to find whatever vulnerability she has and then kind of keeping that as my secret. Uh, is, is, is the key or was the key to me making her, you know, more interesting than just someone who says something mean to somebody. You know what I mean? Got it. How did you prepare for this classic sitcom style? The preparation for the show was, was intense and amazing. Um, you know, we, we all were sort of instructed not really instructed, suggested to um, watch all these great old sitcoms, you know, from Bewitched and Dick Van Dyke and the Brady Bunch, and you just go through history, you know, and you watch them to get a sense of the style and how everyone carried themselves, how they looked, how they talked, how they sat, um, you know, with sort of unspoken rules, you know, body language, just to kind of know, you know, get an idea of where the, even the camera would be placed to really capture the feel of that particular show in that time. Um, so yeah, there was just a lot of like that kind of prep work, getting the voice right, getting the Mid-Atlantic voice correct. Um, the, the, oh my gosh, I just like making sure I got that right and I didn't slip into some sort of annoying British 
sometimes I would weirdly go Southern. I don't know what happened, but I've done that my whole life. Suddenly I just have a draw and I don't know where it comes from. No one in my family is Southern. So just to, maybe that's a, a mystery made for Marvel. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm from the South, so that was funny. Um, <laughs> describe, describe the efforts behind achieving the right looks for the errors, like costuming or production design, and how that helped you get into character. I would say for approaching this show and the character of Dottie, working from the outside in was probably more crucial than and any other project I've worked on. I think typically when I approach a character, you know, I try to get it from the inside first and then the rest of it kind of comes out. Um, but I, you know, I needed to stick with a certain, you know, template, you know, the, I, was, I knew I was going to look a certain way. I knew I had to talk a certain way. I knew I needed to sort of be believable in this, this particular time. Um, so I needed to get all that stuff, the outward stuff done first and get that down and be comfortable with that. Um, and definitely like the moment you, you slip on you know, vintage clothes and you, know, you put on the wig, we were all wigged. Um, you know, once that wig came on, that was, that was, that was definitely like, I was, it was like, okay. You know, it informed me about who I needed to be as opposed to me informing what I was going to look like. Great. Thank you. And that was harmless and done. We can wrap. <laughs> Super fun. Why do you think fans love Wanda and Vision and their relationship so much? I think the reason that fans like the relationship between Wanda and Vision is because because even though he's in a really weird red costume thing and um, Scarlet's a little scary with her powers, I think they're very human. Uh, I think that they, they are fallible and, um, and I think people identify with them. That's what I think. And they're also very charming. There you have it. Great. What do you think when you, what did you think when you first heard about the concept for WandaVision? When I first heard about the concept for WandaVision, I threw my hands in the air and just thought, well, okay, somewhere in here, I heard sitcom. I know how to do that. So I, I, I'll just go with that until someone tells me I'm on the wrong track. <laughs> it was, when it is told to you, it's very, very hard to, uh, to understand. When you're actually doing it, it gets easier and easier and easier. And then if you're like me and you ask 8 million questions, people will tell you things just to shut you up. So, you know, I think that I have sort of an understanding of, what this is a little bit. <laughs> How did you prepare for the classic sitcom style? Um, I didn't have to do a lot of preparing for the, for the classic sitcom style because I've done so much of it and I'm old and um, I've lived through a lot of it. So uh, it wasn't, it wasn't as historical for me as it was for others. Um, I find that if I if I figure out where women are in, like women in the 50s are very different from women in the 70s. And if I can locate what that is, then I'm, it's pretty much free sailing for me. So I, that's kind of, I guess, how I attack it. Who do you portray and what is she like? So I portray Mrs. Hart. She's very mysterious because she has no first name. Um, I am, 
Vision works for my husband and we are invited to their house for dinner. Um, they are new to the neighborhood and so we are going to meet them. Um, uh, Mrs. Hart is, I think, very kind and, um, and very curious. And I would watch her carefully. Speaking of that dinner, describe how the dinner goes with the hearts and the vision. I think one of my most fun moments, there were, there were a few um, in this Marvel world, but I think like, like one of the most fun was the dinner table scene with um, Fred and Lizzie and Paul. Um, I, I I knew that what I was being asked to do was going to be the first crack in, or, or, or the, like the first clue maybe that there was more to this. And it was really exciting to do. I got to do two things at one time. I got to be as big as I wanted to be. I had no one saying, pull it back, Deborah Joe, pull it back. Nobody said that to me. I just went to town. I, it is one of the most fun things that I have ever done, ever. And I also, one of my favorite foods is scrambled eggs <laughs> and that's what they served. So it was, it was a win-win for me all the way around. Love it. Describe the experience of shooting episode one in front of the live audience. Um, shooting in front of a live audience is, is something that I, well, first of all, it's my favorite thing and I've done just a ton, a ton of it. Um, um, and I've also just recently been doing a lot of theater. So I, um, I love an audience. I get so much energy from it. And I, um, it, it's, nice, it's nice to have that audience when you're also doing work on camera because you get, you get an audible feedback. You, you know where you stand. This one was a little different though because um, the audience, now that I know what the Marvel world is, um, this audience was coming in to see a Marvel thing and they got a sitcom. So that just made it really funny for me. Just really, really funny for me. The, the reaction was a little bit mixed there in the beginning. Once they got used to it and accepted it, it was great. I think they were happy to see Vision alive. But um, in the beginning, it was, oh my gosh, I laughed inside. I laughed so hard because I thought, no, no, this is very different, this thing that you're going to see. Why do you think people have such an infinity for Wanda and Vision? Why? I think people really connect to Wanda and Vision because I, there are two ways you can go as a, a human being. You can either have your trauma, um, you know, like Wanda has had, have, have your trauma turn you into a, a person who just hides or a person who just is very powerful. And I think Wanda in particular is someone who's taken her trauma and it's just made her that much more powerful and she's survived. And then she's found this unique love in a synthesoid, um, someone who's, who's in spite of the fact that he is mechanical, um, has found this wonderful humanity. Uh, so I, I actually think it's love. It's the love between Wanda and Vision, and that's why they like them. Well, I think uh, it's it's possible that the two of us identify with them as a couple as well, because I'm always I always approach things a little bit more from the logic side, and um, I'm always interested in what this thing called emotion might be. Right, and when I get angry, my hair just rises up. <laughs> <laughs> nice. How did this project come about and how did you feel about working on a project in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Well, we were absolutely thrilled when this project came up because Marvel is just so cool and and our kids loved it. And suddenly we thought, oh, if we're working on a Marvel property, our kids will think we're cool. They don't. 
<laughs> Spoiler <laughs> that, alert. That will never happen. But um, but but the Marvel dream did come true when uh, Matt Shackman, who was a friend of mine from Yale, gave us a call. I think a year and a half ago, and pitched us the the basic high concept of um, Wanda and Vision in the suburbs through the ages, and um, and no and what's going on? Why? Um, and we were like, that sounds incredible. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and from there, it was off to the races. Explain how theme songs helped establish the feel for sitcoms through the years and how you captured that for WandaVision. Our job for WandaVision was to really establish time and place and era. Um, so where the movies might have like a typeface go across like Segovia 2009 or whatever. Um, our job was to set that. And um, growing up, we watched sitcoms across the decades that would really set that feeling of like, I Love Lucy takes place in the 50s. Big bands are playing, um, you know, in the 60s. And, and all those shows had iconic theme songs that would be repeated every week. They got into your head and they became part of you. And I think that um, that's the other role of the, I mean, that's the other um, job of the theme song to sort of, to get into, to get into your head. To pull you into the world through earworms. <laughs> you touched on this um, briefly, but what kind of research did you do to identify the style for each era? If you could provide an example, um, contrast one era from another, generally speaking in terms of theme songs. We um, we did a lot of research uh, for one division for you know into theme songs, but in a way we didn't have to because we were we were such TV kids growing up and we watched so many reruns. Um, Our lives were research. All those hours in front of the TV as a kid, where your mom was like, "Go out and play." And we're like, "No, I'm going to need to know <laughs> this this era of theme songs because uh, I'm going to get a work, job." Mom going to get a job one day making theme songs. Um, so the research was there because these songs from all of these different eras lived in our bodies. And uh, and we listened, but we did go back and, you know, just as adults to uh, to revisit them. And it was a pleasure, just a pleasure to listen to all this old gold from, from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And our orchestrator, Dave Metzger, who also is our orchestrator for Frozen and Coco, um, and Frozen 2, uh, he also has extensive knowledge of what instruments were used when, as someone who lived through these decades as well and watched all of these shows. And he brought in a lot of his, his great knowledge of, of instruments. Okay. Describe the themes for the first two episodes and how you landed on the idea. Um, the first two episodes of WandaVision take place in the 50s and the 60s. And um, I remember the the script had a little description of, oh, they had even had some dummy lyrics that we kind of helped pattern our song after. Mm -hmm. um, but we uh, wanted to create um, something that was really about love for the first one, about this newlywed couple getting married. Um, we wanted to give it a snap and a bounce and a jazziness to it, but we also wanted it to feel like an iconic love. So we, we've made the, the top note, love. <laughs> That's true. Um, but we also wanted to give them, we, we present the problem of the first decade of how will this duo fit in and pull through oh by sharing a love we basically saying love is going to conquer their challenges they're going to experience in the first episode um and with the second one that that episode is much it's for it's in the 60s um it's more of a bewitched or um what's the other one the uh um phenomena um, no like uh the i dream of genie oh yes kind of kind of show and it's sexier and it's uh, flirtier. So we wanted to, we, we made it a smaller ensemble. We gave it that sort of fun party feel. And uh, uh, we had people just saying WandaVision in, yes. in sort of a, I don't know, I don't, it, it's a little bit like that naughty. Austin, that Austin Powers yeah. kind of um, 
the British swingers vibe. And this is the last question. Describe the process working together and with the filmmakers on these songs. Hmm. The process really began with a wonderful conversation with Matt Shackman and Jack Schaefer, um, the makers of the show, uh, where they, you know, they explained this incredible high concept uh, storytelling they were going to do using episodic sitcom TV to tell this epic, epic Marvel story. Um, and we were very lucky because we share, we're around the same age, we were all of the rerun generation. So we shared a lot of the same references. And Bobby had actually gone to school with Matt Shackman mm -hmm. and worked together before. Um, they had directed, Matt Shackman directed a version of The Tempest at Yale for which Bobby wrote songs. Um, so they had kind of a shorthand there. Um, and then we just took a deep dive into researching the decades and the music. And I gotta say, this doesn't happen very often, but um, after they had finished pitching it to us and pretty much everything they showed us, uh, we, you, we're used to um, giving a little bit more of a pushback um, than we ever did with, with Matt and Jack because we were just always so sold with everything they, they gave us that we were always like, yes! <laughs> um, and it, it felt strange to be so positive because I'm I'm usually grouchy and kind of I, I'm always like well what if it was this what if it was not mm -hmm. you know and I, I, this time this time I really I was just very excited by everything they they brought us and the truth is I I would wake up maybe there were two weeks of where I would wake up almost every morning with I know what the I know what the next theme song is. Here's the hook, and here's what it is. And I would like write the lyrics in a towel out of the shower. Um, she would write the lyrics while uh, dressed in a towel. Dressed in a towel. <laughs> the, the lyrics the are day. not on a towel. It's somewhere. the end of the day, guys. Thank you. That was great, you guys. Appreciate